In 2016, a young woman with over 40 injuries was left to die. This is whilst her millionaire lover, the alleged perpetrator, slept. The murder case, well, it attracted national attention when the controversial rough sex defence was raised. And that's right, the rough sex defence. The subsequent conviction and sentence, meanwhile, caused outrage for good reason. Outrage that would lead to a change in legislation. This is the killing of Natalie Connolly. Welcome back to my channel. This is True Crime with me and McKenna, just in case you're new here. I release my crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday night, every single week, at the same time, religiously. Also, I'm very aware that I'm wearing quite a lot of red lipstick today, and therefore, if it ends up all over my teeth, I apologise in advance. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. I digress before I have even started today's true crime content. Not gonna lie, today's case is horrifying. Horrifying for lots of reasons, but for those of you who don't know my channel, one of the things that I struggle with is sometimes the way that judges interpret crimes. And this particular case will certainly not disappoint you so far as being in line with those views that I sometimes hostile-wise have with said judges. There is this idea in the UK, I'm sure it's elsewhere, but in the UK, that because they wear wigs and because they sit there all austere and stoic and clever that, you know, they get things right. They don't. They tell people that women deserve raping because of the clothes that they wore. They give sentences that are completely bizarre when you compare them to other crimes. And you know why? Because judges don't stick to a specific point of law, they're able to look through all of these different classifications and draw upon what they decide. Bad day of the week, usually bad sentence for the person accused and found guilty. Good day of the week may get a completely different result. Throwing it out there before I start today's, just want you to be aware, I do feel triggered by today's case. That's what I'm saying. In December 2016, 26-year-old Natalie Connolly was in a new relationship with 39-year-old John Broadhurst. Now, at the time, Natalie had an eight-year-old daughter from a previous relationship. She was a single mother, and that little girl was called Madison. And clearly, I will note that for Natalie, meeting a new partner in John Broadhurst symbolised something really positive for lots of different reasons. One, because she found the opportunity of engaging in a new relationship, which is always exciting. But there was an additional bonus to this relationship. Broadhurst was a really successful businessman. In fact, he was a multi-millionaire property tycoon. And when you think about attraction and attractiveness levels, the idea that somebody sees somebody who is wealthy and is attracted to their money is a myth. There are Certain individuals, I would imagine. I don't know, all of Hugh Hefner's lot probably saw the dollar signs. But for the most part, when it comes down to being attracted to somebody who's very, very wealthy, a lot of that comes down to the fact that they're incredibly successful, they're intelligent because of that success often, they're intriguing and interesting because of their mindset and determination, and it makes you more attracted to that person. It's not that you wouldn't find them ordinarily attractive, it just amplifies and raises up that attractiveness level. And so for this young woman who's been on her own, has a child, he is really special because 
he stands to be somebody that could offer her not just love, but a level of security, which is completely normal. It's a big foundation in what women particularly want within relationships. There are differences. We don't like to talk about them. We don't like to talk about the differences between men and women. We don't like to. I don't know why. Obviously, men and women have a lot of things that are the same and are in common. But there are also distinguishing factors that we look for. Just going to throw it out there. Men like a woman that laughs at them. They find a woman that laughs at them more attractive because, hey, who doesn't want to be found funny? Whereas a woman who is really funny, yeah, unfortunately, they don't attract the same level of being attracted to by these guys, which is really sad because I think I'm quite funny. So I genuinely think it should still be that I am found attractive for cracking jokes that make people laugh. Just making it about myself right now. But certainly women and the foundations of what makes people attractive to us, part of that is a level of security and protection because primordially, gender-wise, reality-wise, when it comes down to it, men are physically stronger. But in our modern day, it is success and money that has essentially transcended the requirement of physical domination and replaced it. So we look at men, women indeed, who are very successful and wealthy, and they can provide security and protection as a physically dominant person would have been able to do aeons ago. So this is where Natalie is in this moment. This guy is good looking, he's wealthy, he's older, He's got a fortune of around 15 million pounds and that in itself is something that's going to make her feel super excited. He also had three children from previous relationships and it is worth noting that he did leave his fiance when she was pregnant with their second child. I appreciate relationships break down for a whole heap of reasons. Just because somebody leaves a relationship when somebody is pregnant, even if they do so whilst having an affair with another person, it doesn't mean that they are the devil incarnate. What I am saying, or noting at least in this moment, is that when he meets Natalie, he was actually in a relationship with somebody else who was pregnant. And arguably, I would suggest that that makes foundations within that relationship problematic because when you leave a relationship because you're in a relationship with somebody else at the same time, when you start that relationship with the person that you left that person for, you're always going to have some insecurity. Oh, this is the kind of person who's comfortable having an affair with me. And for the partner, this is the person who's comfortable cheating on a partner with me. They are foundational fractures and can lead to big problems of trust in relationships. So, Natalie and Broadhurst, they meet in a pub, very typical place to meet, and I will be honest, their relationship, it progressed really, really quickly. I think many of us can associate understanding what it feels like to be completely infatuated with somebody. Some people, they just seem to tap in to a part of our being that makes us feel intoxicated, and literally, after a matter of weeks, she moves with her daughter into the five-bedroomed house that Broadhurst was renting. This is on Kenrose Mill in Kinver, Staffordshire. So he's renting this property whilst his actual main house is being renovated. I would suggest it would have been better for her to wait a little bit longer before moving in. I do not judge Natalie for doing that because at the end of the day, she probably sees his life and thinks, wow, this is something incredible. I'm taking my child and myself into a world that we've never inhabited. Just think of all the opportunities that I'm gonna be able to provide my child with. But the problem with anybody rushing into a relationship like that is, as I've said time and time before, and I imagine I'll say time and time again, you do not know the person. You cannot quantify who they are. And this isn't me even judging Broadhurst in this moment. I'm saying that you have not allowed yourself time to truly understand who has the power in the relationship and that can be a bad thing if it's not equal 
or whether the relationship is really one that is going to make you feel safe in the long term. That noted, it is really challenging when we are dealing with loving feelings. We call it love blindness in therapy for a reason. It's seen as some kind of platitude, a love blind. It's not, it's a reality. You can work with somebody who is clinically very depressed a week prior to the next therapy appointment. Then they walk in, they've had a most amazing interaction with somebody, they've started dating them and they feel on top of the world. It's a love sickness, a love blindness. You can't see the wood for the trees. You're intoxicated, you're drunk on that feeling. Now meeting Broadhurst, it must have felt like a turn for the better in Natalie's life. So as I said, she was a single mum. She had struggled financially. I have been there. Believe me, it is in those moments where you are sat in a house alone worrying about how the hell are you going to pay your bills that you do wish that a prince or princess charming would just arrive in your life and carry you off in the distance, hopefully to a really luxurious castle. Anyway, they meet and she gets this opportunity to live in this nice house, to be financially secure. Broadhurst even goes out and buys her a car, which is a VW Golf, it must have been amazing. He goes ahead and gives her a really good allowance. And it's also worth noting that Broadhurst, by all accounts, as far as what people say in their anecdotes and their recollections of Broadhurst and Natalie is that they seemed very happy in the relationship. So I do want that to be pointed out early on. Also, Natalie's daughter had bonded really well with his actual biological son. So to some degree, they were becoming that new, modern, blended family, and it was working out really well. Now, Natalie, her family experience was a really good one. So she comes from a really loving, supportive family. And one of the things that was very clear during my research is that this woman was adored, genuinely. She was an individual who was cherished by the people who lost her. She was known to be really fun loving. She enjoyed a party lifestyle. Who doesn't in their 20s? I ask you, but just you wait for a decade or so more and things I promise will change. These days I'm just excited by my food order and whether I can get a very high thread sheet for my bed. But clearly she goes out, she enjoys herself and why not? She's young. Now she has a twin sister and her twin sister's called Gemma. And Gemma said, you know, Natalie was somebody who liked to drink when she was out and while she could actually drink a lot it was never anything that caused her a problem in fact she was a really fun she was a really happy drunk one of the things that stood out was she was never aggressive a lot of us will know people who are perfectly okay on a day-to-day -day level and then they have three drinks in them and they turn into a devil literally you don't want to go out with them because you know they're going to fight with a bouncer towards the end of a night or start calling you names even though you know really they're just incomprehensible and have no idea of what they're doing or saying. That was not her. She was never aggressive. She was always considered fun, bubbly, very loving. And other descriptions of her are free spirit, full of fun and a lovely girl. They're quotes. And I think it's important that I'm giving you those quotes because I don't want you to think that I am saying this from my perception of her. This is direct from the mouths of those who knew her. I don't want to pretend that I knew this person. I didn't. But it's really helpful me to form pictures of who these human beings were and are to the people that loved them and knew them. However, there is another perception of her, and this is according to Broadhurst, he says that she was somebody who really enjoyed rough sex. Gonna be honest, guys, don't mind admitting, a lot of people do. Yours truly might occasionally. Don't think there's anything wrong with it. You know, a lot of people like it a bit rough from time to time. But what I want to make clear is we're not talking that she enjoyed full-blown S&M, which, may I add... If she did like full-blown extreme sadomasochism, that would be absolutely acceptable to some people do. 
absolutely, as long as it's consensual between two consenting parties and no serious damage occurs, do what you will. Chandeliers, nipple clamps, hanging yourself up, do whatever you like, as long as it ends up that you're safe. But that's not how it was for her. She enjoyed rough sex. So she liked some beating, slapping, spanking. Those kind of areas were allowed, apparently, according to Broadhurst, in their sex life. And Broadhurst said that, as a partner, it was something that he was happy to indulge in as well. He allowed her, as he would have put it, her predilections. One of the things that Natalie had told her sister was he was good in bed. And that is really important in any good relationship. Certainly telling your friends, your family, that somebody is good in bed is testament to a lustful relationship that is satisfying and fulfilling. My God, I wish that more people had great sexual relationships. Honestly, I think this world would be a way better place if people had intimate partners who they really felt cherished by and they enjoyed their intimate life with reduce a lot of stress and frustration, particularly in certain demographics of the population. I genuinely think that it can be an excellent reliever of stress, and certainly the research would book what I've just said. Discussing your sex life with your nearest and dearest, those who you trust, is normal. But according to his sister, Natalie actually didn't enjoy the rough sex that went on between her and Broadhurst. She found it too much, and she'd actually shown her sister some of the bruising that had occurred because of their rough sex sessions. I'm bringing that in because I appreciate that that is not validation that Natalie didn't enjoy it. Just because her sister is saying it, particularly when we are looking at a case that involves the death of a much-loved sister, I appreciate that feelings will run high and blame will run deep and justice sometimes won't feel as if it has been proven to be effective. So there are loaded feelings in this. But I will bring in the fact that Natalie actually showed her some of the bruising. So she didn't just say, I'm not really into this. She showed her sister evidence and was clearly not happy with the level that their sex was going. These included deep bruises to her chest, so her breast was basically left really darkened with bruising. And on one of the occasions that Broadhurst actually hit Natalie, he hit her hard with this belt, and she was actually unable to sit down the following day. But I do also want it noted at this moment in time, that doesn't mean that he went any further than that. In fact, it could be said that at least at this point in their relationship, there doesn't seem to be any indication that she was in a position where she felt at threat or at risk. And okay, the sex may have been a little too forceful for her liking. And like so many people out there, she maybe didn't know how to ask for this to be dialed down. I think this is a classic in so many relationships. We find somebody, we fall in love with them or lust with them. We move our relationship fast. They like certain things. We put up with it because at the end of the day, we don't want them to find us unattractive sexually. And it pushes our boundaries to a place where we're really not that comfortable, but we don't want to disappoint them. And while that means that you can't then blame in this circumstance Broadhurst for enjoying what he enjoys potentially or believing that she indeed enjoys what he's doing, because remember... It could be that Natalie is clearly expressing to her sister or to her friends, I don't really like this. I'm not really enjoying it. These are the kind of injuries that I've sustained. But she's not necessarily rejecting that kind of play. And sex is adult play. So it could be that in spite of the fact she seems unhappy on one level, she's accepting of it on another. Thus, Broadhurst isn't understanding the fact that he is pushing her buttons in a way that she really isn't enjoying to the extent that she wishes that she could. This happens, as I said, in relationships. It takes a bit of time for us to get confident enough to go, I don't like that. I don't enjoy that. That isn't for me. I've worked in a lot of relationships, sex therapy, and I've had a lot of people in those circumstances where they just need to own the fact that they deserve the sex that they want and not deserve the sex that they feel they have to put up with. So just putting it out there, that's the reflections of both sides. Now, both Natalie and Broadhurst 
had spoken openly to people about their sex life. They'd also spoken openly to people about the bruises that their sex life had caused. Natalie had even sent a photograph of one of her particularly bad bruises. And again, I'm putting that in there because for me, that suggests the level of intimate uncertainty on Natalie's part. I think the reason that she's sending it to her mother is because she wants somebody who she knows will compassionately respond, who will understand and accept, but will also offer some advice and guidance around what's happening and maybe express concern and give her some guidance on how to approach it. The fact that she's sending pictures of her bruises is not saying that she's doing it for titillation. It's saying that she probably believes during these episodes and sex sessions that it's going a little bit too far. We get to Sunday the 17th of December, this is 2016. Broadhurst driver actually picks them up in a Range Rover, it's around lunchtime. I must be nice to have a driver, mustn't it? With respect, I digress on this, but the idea of somebody having a driver and just picking me up. I want a driver, I do. It's my husband because I don't have a car. But the point is, it's a nice idea being picked up and I can imagine for Natalie, she's gonna be a little bit blinkered by this, isn't she? She's in a relationship with a guy that she really likes. He seems much more worldly wise. He's got a great career and he's in a position where he can treat them beautifully. And Natalie and Broadhurst basically decide that they're gonna go out for the day and after being picked up, they start drinking. They start drinking relatively early and essentially they don't stop. They end up in a pub having a pub lunch, then they later on watch West Brom, the match that was on at the Hawthorne Stadium. Then they carry on drinking more there and it's at this point that they also take cocaine I appreciate some people are very judgmental about drugs. I'm just bringing this in because it's important in how things transpire to some degree. I actually cast absolutely no judgment on people who recreationally use drugs. It's not my job or place. I will note though, when you take alcohol with cocaine, we have a bit of a problem because what happens, and for those of you who've taken drugs like this, you will appreciate it, but just on a physiological level, Cocaine manages to cheat the system. So, somebody like myself, shall we throw me in here? Just as an example of a real lightweight when it comes down to alcohol, I have two to three glasses of wine and I need somebody to come and carry me home. That's why I don't drink alcohol when I go out. It's just not worth it. Occasionally I do. Occasionally it hasn't ended well, I'm gonna say that. I'll tell that story another time. But arguably, if you have, like me, a slight frame and a low tolerance and then you drink to your full and fill and then you have some cocaine it kind of sobers you up at least you think you've sobered up and then you drink more now we all know that that compromises our blood alcohol level and we also know that as that depresses so the feeling of the cocaine is depressed by the extra alcohol we look to fire up that elevation so that we don't feel that suppression in energy which is why people take more cocaine and this is very common but it can have some pretty dramatic and dangerous impact on the body if people are using it in this context particularly if you are a small woman so during the day between them they drank an unbelievable amount pretty much drank continuously at pubs and Natalie in particular, she consumed vast amounts of alcohol. Again, let me make this clear. This is not a judgment call on Natalie at all, but because of her size, this is gonna have a real impact on her body and a problematic impact, particularly when consumed with the cocaine. Also, personally, if I was in a situation where I was out, with my husband and I was inebriated and he saw me drinking a lot, he would stop me. And he would stop me for good reason because it's not gonna go a good way. So I don't just think it's about Natalie wildly consuming this alcohol, which we've heard from her family, she liked to drink, but she was always in control of that. And she was a good time girl in those moments. She certainly wasn't aggressive or hostile. And it seems like what they're saying is she knew her limits. 
that doesn't seem to be the case on this day and I do feel when we're in a relationship we have a duty to our partner to be protective to some degree. It's not just her that is making these decisions without, shall we say, having a potential of an onlooker saying to her, you need to check that behaviour. Anyway, this is what's going on during the day. They later have a meal at an Indian restaurant and with respect, it seems like they were having a great day. So this is not something that is playing out where people are witnessing them together and they're being seen as hostile, provocative, emotionally abusive, violent, any of those things, that's not what people are seeing. They are noted as appearing to have a really good day. And then, as that comes to the end, Broadhurst driver comes and picks them up, takes them back home. By this point, Natalie is severely intoxicated, absolutely severely intoxicated to the point where she even leaves a mobile phone in the car and the driver has to come back and drop that off he returns the phone to her and he leaves for a second time around 11 20 p.m now broadhurst also drunk nowhere near to the extent natalie was and that's interesting for me because if you're in a situation where your partner is literally inebriated to a dangerous level that we'll talk about later on he isn't in that situation so he obviously is a bigger guy that's going to make a difference but it also potentially means that he hasn't drank to the level that she has so he's able at this moment in time to still be able to make decisions still be able to make choices now i cannot without making stuff up which i'm not going to do guys i'm not going to just make stuff up about what happens next I'm not going to pretend I was there. I'm not going to say what they were thinking. I'm just going to give you what the research has shown me. We don't know exactly what happened after this point because there is a major problem, a major flaw. We only have one person's side of the story and that's Broadhurst's version of events because Natalie isn't going to survive the night. We're never going to hear from her. Her body's going to do the talking to some degree. But this is going to be a one-way experience as far as witness testimony goes in this scenario we just have broadhurst telling us what played out and i'm going to leave you at the end of this to tell me what you think to tell me what you feel whether justice was done for this woman sunday the 18th of december 2016 it's 9 23 a.m emergency services they get a call and this course from Broadhurst. He tells the dispatcher that he's basically woken up in the morning and found Natalie dead. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm trying not to be judgy. I'm trying not to be biased. I'm a bit biased, but I'm trying not to be. I have made a phone call while I have found somebody that I love dead. It was horrific. I can feel it now. The last thing that I would say during a conversation to emergency services, particularly when I was hysterical, was they're dead as a donut. That's what he said. He said she's dead as a donut. I cannot compute the lack of empathy and reality in that statement, that alone causes me enormous concern. It really does. Where is the empathy? Where is the humanity? This is a woman who's a mother to a child. She's dead. And he's using those kind of examples, dead as a donut, to converse with the dispatcher. Now Broadhurst does attempt CPR, and that's important because again, that just suggests in that moment, he was trying his best to do anything, something to try to help her, albeit the fact that he's just described her as dead as a donut. The paramedics arrive and it's not the scene you'd imagine. So we're not talking about somebody who's been found dead in bed. We're not talking about an individual who suddenly died and their partners found them in a scenario where they were trying to wake them up or 
you know, when that person's potentially fell down the stairs in the middle of the night, we're not talking about that. When they arrive, Natalie is literally lay on her back at the bottom of the stairs and she's naked, she's got a skirt hitched up around her waist and she is lying in a pool of blood. It's also clear straight away she's been dead for quite a long time, rigor mortis had set in and they could see immediately that she had suffered some significant injuries prior to her death. So her chest was covered in bruises. They found bruises all over her lower back, all over her buttocks. And these were also later established as thick hemorrhages into fatty tissue. So we're talking sustained beating enough to hemorrhage, so to bleed into the fatty tissues. She also had an injury to her head. Her left eye socket was fractured. Anybody who listens to any of the videos that I have done, I talk about eye socket fractures. They take considerable force. Apart from being agonizing, we're talking about blunt force trauma, objects, a really heavy fist. We're not talking about some light beating in an s and episode that was consented to in sex. In my humble opinion, the worst injuries were the injuries that actually occurred to her vagina. I will go into quite a lot of detail later on about this and I want you to know that I'm not doing it because I want to be sensationalist or clickbaity. It's got to be said, otherwise you won't understand the actual case or the judge's beliefs about this and then the consequent changes in law. So I have to do that. And when I get to that point, please feel free to just mute or turn it off for a minute. Personally, I want to listen to this stuff because I want to make sure I give Natalie legacy. I want to know the information because even though it's dire, it's important. She was important and what's come from her is important. Also, it's found that her face had literally been sprayed with bleach. With bleach. Now, Broadhurst later claimed they had basically done it to clean the blood off her face. Said he didn't want her looking a mess. Just gonna put it out there, Broadhurst. Just gonna put it out there. Water. That's the key, isn't it? Why, if you want to wipe blood off somebody's face, are you going to go and get bleach? First of all, bleach is corrosive. It burns. Also, it would colour her hair. It would make it go a horrible yellow colour. That's what bleach does. But also, let's just throw it out there. Let's just say that maybe she wasn't actually dead. Why would you put bleach on her face, it's going to cause serious problems for her eyes. You know, anybody with even a microsecond's worth of sense would know that. But that's what he says. Paramedic also noted, by the way, at this point, that he really didn't seem, as a partner who's just lost the woman that he's going to be in love with, that he didn't really seem that concerned by her death. In fact, he seemed not to be too bothered about what was playing out in front of him. I also want to note that we also have to accept that people go into shock. They are numb. They are terrified. They don't know what the hell's going on. They're sobering up from the night before. This is their worst nightmare came true. I appreciate that is also a possibility. But certainly for a paramedic whose job it is to pick up on the body language, expressions, and verbalizations of individuals that they visit during situations and scenes like this, it's important. They know what to expect to some degree, and it doesn't feel in context. Now, as I said, I'm gonna talk about what was going on with Natalie, and I need to go through the, I suppose, worst parts of this before we talk about the legal implications than the way that it transpires in court. First of all, as I said earlier on, Natalie was really intoxicated. She had blood levels of alcohol, which was 389 milligrams per 100 milligrams of blood. Think about that. So that's a lot 
of alcohol in your blood. That's the equivalent of 272 grams of alcohol, about five bowls of wine. I would be hospitalized by bottle three. I am not taking the mick. I'm not. I genuinely would. I would be hospitalized. Seriously. Couldn't do it. Now, the expert opinion who had to evaluate what had happened to Natalie, they concluded that she had had a really dangerous, possibly life-threatening amount of alcohol in her system. In fact, the expert who commented on this particular case, they said they had never seen such high levels of alcohol and cocaine together. Now, according to those blood alcohol levels, she was actually in a coma stroke death category. So she was really in a position where she was very vulnerable because of the levels of alcohol within her. You can also imagine, well, wait a minute, we're in a coma death category, just keep that in mind, because of what I'm gonna talk about afterwards. Is this woman throwing herself around, enjoying things? Is she able to walk? Just think about that. Is she able to consent? These are all important things that I want you to consider whilst I continue talking about this case. Now, her symptoms of this coma death category She'd be, according to the expert, not me, near or complete unconsciousness, in a coma. She'd have a subnormal temperature. She'd had an impairment of circulation and respiration, so breathing. And also, she would possibly die. She would have been unable to stand or to walk. She wouldn't have been able to string a coherent sentence together. So that is important. Bear in mind what we talk about where consent is concerned. I'm saying that for good reason. Look, when I send my boys out to parties, I have for many years, since they were 13, talked about consent. And no, I wish I didn't have to. And no, I don't think it's nice that boys have to really worry about this stuff to the degree that they do these days, but they do. Because a girl cannot consent when she's drunk. Back in the 80s, you know? Stuff happened at parties when you were inebriated and it was terrible, but there wasn't necessarily a law to protect you. These days, rightfully so, there is. And you have to educate kids about that because if a kid is drunk and they can't consent, particularly if they're underage, that makes it even worse because then it's not something they can consent to anyway. But these are issues that we need to express because it becomes rape. And so she is not in a place where she is being coherent at all. But the injuries internally that I'm going to talk about, they were just catastrophic. So the internal injuries that she sustained, they just continued to bleed out. They would have, if she had been helped, needed stitches. But because she had lost so much blood into the carpet, they weren't actually able to establish just how much blood she lost. She'd bled out, basically. But what they could tell is that she had suffered more than 40 injuries, and they believed that she died pretty much as soon as she was left alone on that floor at the bottom of the stairs, either pretty immediately or soon after. They said that she would definitely have bled to death within an hour, which is a harrowing idea, isn't it? To a really nice day out with your partner. Yeah, you've drank too much, you've taken too many drugs, but the idea that you're bleeding to death at the bottom of a staircase is not something you would ever have been able to predict or comprehend when you set out that day. When they did the report, they were able to establish that Natalie had died from basically a combination of alcohol poisoning and blood loss. Now that was exacerbated, as I said earlier, by the drug consumption cocaine, plus they'd taken poppers and amphetamines, so she was very, very intoxicated, both with alcohol and recreational drugs. Broadhurst is arrested at this point on suspicion of murder. Then he gets taken in for questioning, obviously he does. A woman has been found dead at the bottom of his stairs and it looks like she's seriously injured and has potentially bled to death. So he tells the police about what he and Natalie have got up to the previous day, he talks about the drugs binge, the alcohol binge, and Broadhurst also says that basically Natalie got in and then she just wanted to carry on drinking and that she drank an entire bottle of Amaretto, that they also had this substantial amount of cocaine and it's at this point where apparently she's had a full bottle of 
amaretto, a liqueur that's really strong, quite nice, in moderation. But apparently she's coming after drinking all of this wine and being really intoxicated. She's left her phone in the driver's car, had to come back and drop it off. She's in a right state. And now she's drunk a full bottle of amaretto. I mean, that's really dangerous anyway. And apparently after she's done this and taken more cocaine, he and Natalie then get involved in rough sex at her request. At her request. Yeah. So apparently, in spite of the fact that this person who has examined her body and looked at blood alcohol levels is saying she wouldn't be able to speak, be coherent, walk, was probably in a coma stroke death state, she's able to ask specifically for rough sex and then to additionally ask him to beat her on her buttocks or with a belt. If you were really drunk and able to ask to be hit with a belt, you won't feel the pain in the same way. However, you have to be able to do that. Just saying. But we do know that when people are intoxicated, they get up to things that they wouldn't do when they're not. The same with drugs, genuinely. If you look up any research on sex, particularly when mixed with cocaine or ketamine or MDMA, often these are used in positions and places where people are wanting to have a certain type of sex because it kind of enhances their capacity to indulge without inhibitions and pushes their boundaries in ways that they wouldn't ordinarily. But like I said, at the end of the day, according to what we're being told, she could be in a coma at this point. But anyway, he says that he isn't comfortable with the idea of hitting her on her buttocks with a belt. So instead he uses a church suede boot instead. He says he also beat her on her breasts. She asked for that, he said. And when he stopped, she actually demanded that he carried on. And one of the things that Broadhurst told the police was that Natalie really liked having her chest and buttocks being slapped. So Broadhurst told the police this. Last night she actually asked me to smack her harder and I thought I would smacked her bottom hard enough because I could see a bruise coming on it. I stopped then once I started to see it, but that was her thing to get bruised. Now, according to Broadhurst, at this point when she's almost in a coma, according to experts, she asks after asking to be bruised and is now bruised to the point where he's seeing the bruise form. She then starts asking for some more extreme intimate sex acts. Yeah. And when I describe this, just bear in mind the amount of alcohol Natalie's had and the amount that can basically kill her. Anyway, Broadhurst we know is far less intoxicated. So he can recall all of this for a start. We're not talking about someone who's blackout drunk, are we? We're not talking about someone who isn't realizing what's going on. He's compass mentors to some degree. But according to Broadhurst at this point, Natalie is making all of the requests, right? All of them. They're all about her making these requests that are getting, shall we say, more and more extreme. So Broadhurst tells the police that Natalie, and this is when you're going to hear what happens to her, so like I said, if you need to tune out, fine, but I need to say this. She apparently asked him to insert a bottle of spray carpet cleaner into her vagina. And not the ones that are round. I'm talking about the large plastic bottles with the trigger. So automatically, I'm really concerned at this point. He isn't inebriated to her degree, without a doubt. Apparently, she is asking him to do extreme things, but he's still compass and apparently didn't want to hit her hard. So changed the implement, such as a belt, for a slipper to prevent her getting seriously injured, apparently. But now he's okay to insert into her vagina a spray carpet cleaner 
with a trigger. And he says that and when he did that, it got stuck. So he tries to unsuccessfully remove it several times and he can't. And so to get it out, he basically has to put his hand into Nally, grab the bottle, twist the bottle and to pull. Now, the plastic bottle broke during that, by the way. So we're now adding to the danger, aren't we, in that scenario? It's a carpet cleaner. Eventually, he says he managed to remove it with lube. But it would take a 11-year-old with rudimentary understanding of biology to know the type of severe internal injuries that are going to arrive from that kind of behavior. I know that for any of you girls and women who are watching this, this is just horrifying for us to imagine. I'm sure lots of us have used sex toys. I'm sure that we completely appreciate that sometimes we push our boundaries a little bit further than we would ordinarily, and we then redress that balance and recognize what's right for us and wrong for us. But there has been nothing in Natalie's prior history that would suggest that she would want this kind of thing during sex. She's already expressed to her mother and her sister that she doesn't like the kind of bruising that she's getting from the play that they've had prior to this. In the process of that horrific thing happening, she gets deep lacerations to her vagina and it results in an arterial and venous hemorrhage. And that means essentially that both veins and arteries are cut. But this is just rough play, right? This is just a bit of s and Now Broadhurst goes on to tell the police that yeah, he noticed a reasonable amount of blood at the time, but apparently Natalie told him she was fine. Yeah. Now I'm just gonna throw it out there, guys. I want your opinions. Throw it out there. This woman who has just had these deep lacerations to her vagina internally, they've resulted in arterial and venous hemorrhages. So her vein and her artery cut. Apparently she's like, I'm fine. I'm fine. Said no woman ever. You start bleeding heavily from your womb area, your vagina area, you are going to ask for help. Why? You don't know what's going on. You have no control over it. You want it to stop. You know something bad is going on. You need it treated. Drunk or otherwise. Even if she was cogent enough to speak, that would be the response. And you know what? If she wasn't cogent to speak and she is bleeding and saying it's fine as a partner who's not as inebriated by a long way, what are you going to do? When you've just done what you've done to get that out of her. When you know the causation is you removing that bottle from her internally, what are you going to do? You're going to accept the inebriated, near-death, comatose woman who apparently, by the way, is saying she's fine, just slurring her words a bit. You're going to accept that? No, you're not. You're not going to accept that because you're not a medic she's not a medic and something serious is playing out in front of you right now that is a big problem and a big red flag for me so he's telling the police of course at this point that she's just really slurry she's just really drunk and she's just speaking a bit of gobbledygook again i'm going to keep saying this bear in mind she's had enough alcohol to induce a state of coma and death now add to this that she's had horrific, life-threatening internal lacerations inflicted on her. That would have bled profusely. I'm getting a different picture than the one Broadhurst is conveying just at this moment in time. Don't know about you. Also, Broadhurst then goes on to tell the police that Natalie had actually banged her head after falling into a drunken state, apparently you'd notice blood on the door and the balustrade, which is the staircase, you'd also notice blood coming from her nose. I cannot compute this. 
before I go on further, where I have to compute other things that I find difficult to compute, how many of us have partners that we love? Some of us have partners we love and they annoy us. They frustrate us. Sometimes we feel like we don't even like them. This is all normal in life. But in the moments where a partner is injured or hurt or sick, what happens? You have this rush of empathy, compassion, fear. All you want is to make sure they're safe. You're like, oh my God, what is going on? If I saw my husband or if he saw me bleeding from the head, bleeding from the nose, and I was drunk and I'd bang my head, it would be nine, nine, nine every day of the week. Believe me, in my household, my husband would like to ring nine, nine, nine if I had a splinter because he's so afraid that something could go wrong. You could get sepsis from that. Who knows? It's a splinter. I know, but these things happen. It doesn't happen. Stop it. But anyway, what I'm saying is there is a level my husband doesn't speak like that, just to put it out there as well. Like Mickey Mouse, to some degree. What I'm saying is, it's a normal reaction, isn't it? For us to actually do something to help them. Now just bear in mind the state that Natalie is in at this moment in time. You know, pretty much anybody would have called an ambulance. Bear in mind, I've just gone through the fact that Broadhurst has made it clear that he's done nothing wrong. It was wanted sex by his partner. She's got blind drunk, she's hit her head, so on and so forth. So why wouldn't he call an ambulance? Just do the responsible thing, right? Get medical attention. That's not what happens, is it? It just leaves Natalie completely unconscious at the foot of the stairs, flat on her back, bleeding out. He says the house was warm. And he says that to the police, you know, it was warm, no problem. At the end of the day, she'd be fine. She just needed to sleep it off, right? And he said that there had been previous occasions where she'd just been in similar states and she'd been fine. So at three o'clock in the morning, Broadhurst just went to bed, didn't even get her a pillow, didn't get her a blanket. And then six hours or so later, he wakes up 9am and that's when he goes downstairs. That's when he discovers Natalie dead where he left her. With respect, who in their right mind would ever leave a partner bleeding at the bottom of the stairs? I don't care how drunk you are. I don't care how drunk they are. I don't care if you've had a row of all rows. I don't care. Your safeguarding duty as a partner, you make sure they are safe and you are not telling me that when he was looking at her bleeding with her skirt hitched up after he'd just done something grotesquely agonizing and impactful on her body that he just went to bed i mean there's being overcautious and there's what i would consider being downright dismissive of reality not caring at all about what's happened to some dear men I love. Now, in spite of the fact that Broadhurst is trying to carve out this reality, I would say that investigators are not buying it particularly. Hmm, I wonder why. Broadhurst, we've found this poor woman. She's been horribly injured at the bottom of the stairs. Can you explain what happened? We just went out, had a few drinks, had some sex. That's how it happened. You created catastrophic injuries on this poor woman. She was asking for it. That's a bit of a problem though. Was she asking for it? Because I think you'll find that she was so intoxicated, they're saying that she was near death. She's very good at being resilient near death. We feel that you're lying massively. Mm. I'm a multimillionaire. Let's see how that works out. You'll be amazed to find out how multimillionaires are treated differently potentially in the legal system. Sorry, I'm just playing that out because I have, shall I say, some stress around what I'm going to tell you down the line in this case. But there is another reason why investigators are not happy with the story he's telling. They're not kind of believing that it played out in the way he said because she's allegedly been messaging other men. So she'd been apparently messaging two ex-boyfriends and also a new man. 
and one of the messages apparently had involved a topless photo. It's alleged, it's alleged, but the police believe this is a provoker and this, to my mind, would support the way that I would say Broadhurst treats her in those final hours as far as just leaving her like a used object. Again, just my point of view, just my perception. Please feel free to disagree with me. But I understand if you're in a relationship and you find out that your partner is messaging other people and you think you're being good to them, and you've had a great day out, that would probably create conflict. Could that conflict spill over? Could you feel that you want to teach that person a lesson? I suppose it's possible. Now, Broadhurst ultimately is charged with Natalie's murder and wounding with intent. So they believe that he is responsible for her death and that he murdered her. He just goes not guilty to both counts. He says she consented to all of them. Honestly, ugh, consented to all of them. Sorry, just gonna, just gonna throw it out there. Are you saying that she consented to having her vein and artery cut to a position where she bled to death, basically? Yes. Are you though? Absolutely. Absolutely, she requested it all. She didn't know, did she? She did. She did. She did. I cannot get this through my head. Yeah, he said, she wanted all the things that happened, but at the end of the day, I didn't mean to kill her and I didn't even mean to cause her serious injury. Yeah, that's his defence. He didn't mean to kill her. Sorry, didn't mean to kill you. I'm sorry, you died in horrible circumstances. I didn't mean to kill you. That's okay then. And you didn't mean to cause a serious injury, really? You inserted a carpet cleaner inside her and then you couldn't get it out and then you ripped it out, essentially. You threw bleach in her face to clean her hair. Are you kidding me? Now, as ever, I imagine that a lot of you listening to me right now want to throw yourself through the screen because of your frustration. But we're going to have to go through this, so please go through it with me. I'm going to have to talk about the law so that you understand fully and we can talk about our feelings afterwards. So basically, he's saying that Natalie consented to all of this injury. He hadn't wanted to kill her. It had been something she'd asked for. Now, bear in mind that for murder, you have to have a guilty state of mind. That's the requirement. And what was used in this case was basically what's been turned as the rough sex defense. So it's also known as the 50 shades of gray defense. Now that means that they were looking at using a defense that suggested that the injuries that would normally amount to like criminal offenses are deemed to have been consensual. Yeah, so that's what they go for. No. Nope. Didn't mean to do it. She wanted it. Awful accident. Case closed. That's what they're looking for. So the case proceeds to trial. Now, just to tell you a little bit about the rough sex defense, which is really important, particularly for women out there to understand it. It was first used in 1972. So Carol Califano's abusive partner basically raised this defense. They avoided a murder conviction and instead they got convicted of manslaughter. Now, this has always been, and rightfully so, a very controversial defence, effectively blames the victim. It literally says they asked for it. Bear in mind, in the UK, back in the 80s, back in the good old days, you know, we had Judge Pickles, he's an infamous one. She was walking down an alley wearing a short skirt. She was asking to be raped. I kid you not. Different defence, nonetheless, same issue. Victim, totally innocent, made to seem as the provocateur. What more could you expect? You were wearing a low-cut blouse. If that isn't an invite for violent rape or sodomy, I don't know what is. This is why I have a problem with the judicial system in lots of places. And this is certainly why I do not appreciate it when commentators out there refer to me, 
shall we say, as not having legal experience, not understanding legal process. Oh, I do. Anybody who watches my channel knows I know a lot about the law and it's an ass a lot of the time. And those individuals who believe that I don't know about the law genuinely need to sense check themselves. A little bit of bitterness and hostility there, but just throwing it in. Judges get it wrong a lot. Barristers are bastards a lot. Victims are blamed too much, even today. So the problem with this whole scenario is even in cases as I was just talking about there, where I was bringing up Judge Pickles and rape cases, at least the victim was there to say what happened. At least there was a testimony, albeit one that essentially was not believed or thrown out, which was terrible. But in this case, there isn't even a victim to talk about it. There isn't a witness to say, no, this happened to me. Victim isn't there to give their side of the story. But this raises some really ethical questions, which is, okay, what kind of things can you legitimately consent to? Because when you think about the fact that you have to give consent if you're gonna undergo surgery, everyone has to do that, otherwise it'll be a serious criminal offense, and rightly so. But the question that's posed is, has a criminal offense actually been committed if you ask someone, for example, to punch you in the face and they do so. So that's what's going on in this moment. Now the UK's defense of consent to bodily harm, that was established in a really landmark ruling in 1993. It was a decision of the House of Lords, it's now called the Supreme Court, in R.V. Brown and others. Just go with me on this guys, it's important that you understand the basis of it. I don't want to bore you, but it's important. Now, this case, it involved a group of homosexual men and they were indulging in sadomasochistic practices. They videoed their sessions and it was fairly extreme stuff. They um, cut each other. They put nails through one another's foreskins. They would defecate on each other. Just a normal Sunday afternoon if you're not doing that stuff, isn't it? I don't know, whenever I have a few minutes spare, I'll just run out, get together with my mates, video myself defecating on them, whilst hammering a few nails through their foreskins. With respect, none of the people who were involved had actually complained to the police. Also, surprisingly, none of them had needed medical attention. That worries me. I think nails going through foreskins could definitely do with a tetanus shot and certainly some strong TCP and a medical wound bandage. Anyway, this had all gone in, right? But one of these videos that they made, well, fell into police hands. Don't know how, sorry, try not to laugh. Try not to laugh. I'm just imagining how it fell into police hands. You know, just gonna get my porn movies out. I'm a member of the law, have a certain predilection for a bit of s and pop it on, my Betamax on my VHS at the time. Oh my god, even for me that's too extreme. They're gonna need a tetanus shot after that. I'm taking this to the station. I'm not saying that, that's, that's how it literally played out. It's just how I like to imagine it in my mind. So anyway, the police get hold of this, and ultimately, every single one of those men, they're arrested. Not only are they arrested, they are charged with inflicting actual bodily harm on each other. Now, at this point, and I understand why, they all argue that they're consenting adults. They said, we wanted to do it, we committed the acts in private, basically, that converted the basements into sex dungeons. And I know what you're all thinking. Are you being judgmental there, Emma, about the sex dungeons? Who doesn't have a basement out there with a sex dungeon? We all do. We don't. We don't. For example, I don't even have a basement. <laughs> if I did, maybe I'd use it as a sex dungeon. I wouldn't. I'd just store loads of cheap pasta and rice, you know, just in case. Probably wouldn't do that either. Probably just have a gym. Probably wouldn't do that either, it would involve working out, wouldn't it? I'm just digressing too much now. But anyway, they're like, this is what we like doing. It was completely consensual. 
why are you arresting us and charging us? So they claim that they had all consented to bodily harm and therefore there had been no crime. Now this case, it actually has some really serious social repercussions and I do understand why, I genuinely do. So a lot of people felt it was an overreach by the judiciary, by the authorities, by the police, because they said that as far as from the outside looking in, what was occurring was that the state was choosing to intervene in an individual's life that was private and consenting. And was that an overreach? You know, if the state could say a group of guys doing things that I personally wouldn't necessarily enjoy doing, actually that's just standard incorrect. I definitely would not enjoy doing no matter what gender I was. It is too far for me, that stuff. The point is they felt it was something they enjoyed and suddenly they're being told by the government and by the authorities, you can't do that. And not only you can't do that, you can be charged for doing that. At the trial, they were all found guilty. So even though there were no victims, essentially, as far as they were concerned. They were all found guilty of that charge. Now, the decision was appealed, and it was appealed to the highest court in the UK. And at the time, that was called the House of Lords. The original convictions at this point, they were ultimately upheld. So what they decided was you cannot consent to infliction of actual or grievous bodily harm. Now, the defendants later they appealed to the European Court of Human Rights. They claimed basically that they had a right to a private life and that that private life had been infringed and that was under Article 8. However, the court ruled that the state could effectively override Article 8 to uphold health and morals of society. Now, I've told you that for a reason. It's important because I want you to think about that when I'm explaining the rest of this case. So bear in mind what I've just told you. That decision made originally in the House of Lords, upheld in Europe. You would expect in the case that we're talking about today, there would absolutely be similar reasoning, right? I would have been in court as a barrister being like, let's look at this prior case because we're dealing with one way worse way worse right now because Natalie was in a scenario where essentially she likely was inebriated to a point where she couldn't even consent. Now bearing this decision in mind, you know, it was upheld by the state and Europe. It was considered that there is a point where it is not acceptable to create harm to a body, even if that body is consenting. So we would expect, wouldn't we? A group of small children would expect this. A group of fraught teenagers would expect this. I don't know. My dogs would likely expect this. You'd be like, there's gonna be some similar reasoning here. They're gonna apply this reasoning when it comes down to the jury, listening to the case, when it comes down to the way it's for, and when it comes down to the judge's ideas around this they're going to apply it to Natalie's case because Broadhurst has claimed that Natalie consented to the injuries and that is no defence according to what I've told you, especially given her completely intoxicated state. But actually, the ultimate decision, well, it causes national controversy and it should have. I'm pointing it out there, guys, it should have. So we get to November 2018, this is just a few years ago. Broadhurst trial begins its Birmingham Crown Court that it's heard at. Prosecution, as you'd expect, they argue that he caused Natalie's injuries and those injuries were injuries that she could never have consented to. They said, whatever may have started willingly, there is no way that Natalie either consented or was able to consent to what John Broadhurst did to her after that, leading to her untimely, unseemly and tragic death. Bear in mind, she's a mother. We're talking about the death of a mother, a sister, a daughter. But you know, we are talking about a woman 
who's left a child behind, a young child, because of this. The prosecution also claimed that Broadhurst had purposely injured Natalie because he wanted to teach her a lesson. He'd found out by the other guys that she was messaging and he'd lost it. So they'd had this drug fueled drunk sex session and he'd intentionally inflicted the injuries on her. And then after she'd actually died, he sprayed her face with bleach because he wanted to cover his tracks, so to speak. However, after the prosecution have gone ahead and presented their case, they actually changed the charge from murder to gross negligence manslaughter. They're evidently, at this point, not convinced that they could secure a murder conviction. I don't know how you feel about it. I can, to some degree, understand that they may think that a member of the jury or members of the jury may listen and believe that it was not intentional and that he had not had intent in his mind when he'd caused the horrible harm, and therefore could they find beyond reasonable doubt that he was guilty? Potentially not, meaning that the prosecution would not secure a conviction. Bear in mind, the law is a game. I want to win. And that's essentially the law, genuinely. Winning is more important to the prosecution than actually getting a sentence that I would say is proportionate to the crime often. Anyway, this happens and let me tell you, gross negligence manslaughter is a way, way less serious offence. And I think I have a bit of a problem with this because bear in mind Broadhurst had been facing a murder charge, carries all the way to a full life sentence so to speak. Gross negligence manslaughter is basically a form of involuntary manslaughter. So Basically, it says that the person who caused the death hadn't actually intended to cause the death at all. But yeah, apparently at this point, yeah, there was no intention to cause her any harm. I mean, you know, just leaving her at the bottom of the stairs, leading to death, no harm intended there. What else? Ooh, just ripping her insides out. That wasn't a problem. Rupturing her brains to a point where she bled to death didn't mean to harm her. What about getting her intoxicated to a point where she was literally in a coma and you didn't ask for any help? No, I didn't mean to harm her. What about just throwing it out there? All the bruises that you inflicted on her when she apparently asked for more. Yeah, I didn't harm her. What about the fact that she hit her head as far as you're concerned and you told people to the point where she's bleeding from her nose and her head and you just left her? Yeah, I didn't harm her. You're literally saying that you didn't cause any injury, knowingly or willingly. Yeah, it's exactly what he's trying to say. In fact, it's exactly what he said. And when I talk about the prosecution, basically, as far as I'm concerned, lowering the bar, as far as the crime that played out right now, we're talking about the fact that when we use the term negligence, that's usually dealt with in civil lawsuits. So when we talk about negligence, it's like road traffic accident claims. However, there is a point of negligence when it's known as gross, so gross negligence. Now, this is when you get criminal sanctions. And for negligence to be criminal, it has to establish various elements for success within those cases. So first of all, duty of care by the defendant to the victim. Now, there was definitely a breach of that duty every day of the week, we can all see that. The breach caused a death in circumstances where there was an obvious risk of death and the nature of the defendant's negligence was so gross, it amounted to a criminal offence. I mean, yeah, obviously every single one of those is covered. But again, are we all going to pretend that there wasn't obvious injury to this woman? Are we all going to pretend that there couldn't have been potentially a different outcome if an ambulance had been called? Are we willing to pretend that this guy went to bed and didn't know that she was bleeding, even though he says himself he had seen a relative amount of blood coming out of her? That he just accepted the fact that she said she was fine? In this case, absolutely, there was a clear duty of care. Broadhurst was Natalie's partner. He was aware of how severely intoxicated she was. He'd also taken part in a sex act that had led to really serious injury. There was a breach of duty of care because instead of getting medical attention, as I've said, he went to bed. Also, there was an obvious risk of death. Her blood alcohol level had put her in a coma, stroke death category. And 
the blood loss from the injuries caused by the bottle, that was obviously going to cause her serious injury. He left her lay on her back, not even sideways. I go to bed, leave them on the side, because if they're sick, they're going to choke to death in their inebriated state. So Broadhurst's failure to act clearly caused Natalie's death. Clearly. He left her to die. He could have got medical attention, could have saved a life. So in all of the circumstances, his actions were definitely grossly negligent. Now, Broadhurst's guilty plea to gross negligence manslaughter was, of course, accepted by the court and the trial was stopped. Why? Because at the end of the day, it costs a lot less, right? Got a guilty plea. Don't need a trial now. Now, I do believe that the prosecution at the point was concerned that they didn't have enough evidence to secure a murder conviction. So they just went, as I said, for the safer option in their minds as a manslaughter conviction. Personally, I understand why a lot of people feel that Broadhurst basically got away with murder. When it came to the sentencing, first off, he's given a one third reduction for the guilty plea. You know how we are. We like to let people plead guilty and see that somehow their crime is not necessarily the crime that it should have been because they said, I did it, you know, I did it. At the end of the day, I don't feel too at peace with that with respect. Furthermore, Judge Mr. Justice Julian Knowles acknowledged he was a man of good character. I appreciate that as a mitigating circumstance. He had previous good character and that's important. When we look at people and their offending behaviour, if they don't have a past history and they have been a decent human being and they have never put a foot wrong, it's important that we take those into consideration. Also, the judge concluded that he had loved Natalie. I'm going to throw my own judgment in here and say he referred to her as dead as a donut. Said no one who loved anyone ever. Just my personal thoughts, throwing it in, you know, for what it's worth. Dead as a donut, not how you react if you love someone. But anyway, apparently the judges thought that he was also allegedly remorseful. Allegedly remorseful. So with that in mind, it's only a woman who's died horribly. It's only a mother of a child. It's only a child who will be brought up without her parent. He got three years and eight months. Of which he'd serve less than two years less than two years. I'm not saying he wanted her dead. Of course I'm not. I'm saying, is that what her life was worth? She died in a torturous way, a really torturous way. And bear in mind the judgment I talked about earlier on in Brown and others. I really struggle to understand the reasoning of the sentencing decision in Natalie's case. So when the judge considered the aggravating and the mitigating factors, the judge concluded that actual bodily harm caused to Natalie had been unlawful. Following Brown and others, therefore, she could not consent to the actual bodily harm. So in this case, we're talking about the severe bruising caused by Broadhurst beating her buttocks with a boot and beating her breasts with her hands. So you would expect the same reasoning to be applied to the grievous bodily harm caused by the bottle. Like, surely it should go that you can't consent to this either. However, following other case law, the judge concluded that the serious injuries to the vagina caused by the bottle were not unlawful. In fact, he said this, I am prepared to accept in your favor that she instigated this. It seems to me that this act was not unlawful, notwithstanding that it did in fact injure her. A woman may lawfully consent to having something inserted into her vagina or rectum for the purposes of sexual gratification, but without an intention to cause injury, even if doing so 
carries a risk of injury and injury is indeed caused. Sorry, I had to do it in his voice and impression of because I can't do it in mine. It appalls me. So yeah, if you want to put that in layman's terms, ladies, somebody comes at you during sex, ruptures you internally with an object, you die, they, in this case, would get to go, hey, she wanted it. She wanted it. I didn't know it was going to cause internal catastrophic injuries with an obviously inappropriate object that I couldn't get out and that ruptured her internally and bled her to death. Yeah. That's exactly what the judge said there. And I am sorry, judge. If you can't consent to actually body harm for the purposes of sexual gratification, then it is wrong. It is crazy that you can consent to being violated with a large plastic bottle complete with a trigger whilst approaching coma or death levels when it comes down to the intoxication you're under. Unbelievable. Now remember, in Brown and others, none of the men were intoxicated. They had clear minds when they consented to the bodily harm. Natalie's level of intoxication made her consent really dubious. Even if she thought she was consenting, could she really? Bearing in mind what he even said in his interview, she was babbling incoherently. But according to the judges, accepted version of events, she may well have fallen whilst drunk and fractured her eye socket. Of course, that makes sense. Also, just to put it again, none of the men in the brown and others required any hospital treatment. But the expert opinion in Natalie's case concluded that the vaginal injury to her alone would probably have caused death due to the sheer blood loss alone. Broadhurst effectively caused Natalie grievous bodily harm by inserting the plastic bottle into her and then he broke it whilst he tried to remove it. And it is bizarre to me that the defendants in Brown and others could not claim consent applied. Yet in Broadhurst's case, the judge was prepared to accept Natalie had consented to insertion of a bottle into her vagina when she was so intoxicated she couldn't form a coherent sentence and later collapsed and died from a combination of alcohol poisoning and blood loss. Does the law really want to set precedents that state someone can consent to such acts in such circumstances? Is that a message that the judiciary wanted to send out to society? Is it surprising, potentially, that gay men were seen as guilty in the way that they were seen as guilty because of homophobia, potentially. But certainly, as far as I am concerned, this case is far worse. And if we set a bar, damn straight, we should follow it. Now, just to clarify, I am not saying that Broadhurst should have been found guilty of murder. Yeah, it is possible that he did want to teach her a lesson for cheating on him. That's what the police were saying at the time. It will have been part of the initial prosecution's belief system. And I don't know, he possibly did have an intention to kill her or to cause her serious harm. But there's enough reasonable doubt to suggest that a murder conviction may have failed. And that's really important because they want to get a conviction. So this will likely be why Broadhurst's guilty plea to manslaughter was accepted. The prosecution evidently did not feel that there was a likely prospect of a murder conviction. On a causation level alone, when you look at all of the injuries, which were awful, one of the things that was going to be problematic is it was difficult to decide whether Natalie had died from her injuries rather than the alcohol poisoning, for example. But... <laughs> Are we going to pretend that this man's sentence was at a level that acknowledges the seriousness of what played out? I can't wrap my head around it. I've seen people go down for way less serious crimes for much longer. I've been involved in cases where genuinely I have felt satisfied where people have uh, street robberies 
and they've been convicted for years longer than this. Yes, street robbery is terrible. Don't mug anyone. Been involved with victims in courts dealing with that. It's awful. But at the end of the day, she lost her life. She bled to death. It was gross what occurred for this woman, for this mother. It feels like the victim has basically been blamed in this case for asking for it. For asking for it. No one asks to be injured that way. And when you're that drunk, you can't consent anyway. Like I said earlier on, as far as I am concerned, the victim has been blamed. Natalie, in this case, has been blamed for asking for it, even though Natalie was not in a position to ask for anything. So I have no idea how that judge can sleep at night. Mind you, I have no idea how a lot of judges can sleep at night. And you know me, there are a lot of judges I'm very positive about. I think they're balanced. And there are some. I think they're wrong ones. And I think that for a very good reason. Very good reason. You don't need any legal qualifications to feel that either. There is a bias within some of them. There is a misogyny. There is a view towards women, which is incomparable to the reality of what women are. But individuals make it into places and spaces that I don't necessarily believe they should. So as far as I'm concerned, I have no idea how she consented to the acts of sex because at the end of the day, she was so inebriated, but the judge said she did. In fact, the judge said that she consented to the sex acts and that was a mitigating factor in sentencing. Yeah, she asked for it guys. And that was the reason to actually mitigate the seriousness of this crime. The judge stated this, I cannot be sure that Natalie was not capable in fact of consenting. Really, read the friggin' autopsy report, sir. Sorry, I shall continue. Notwithstanding her extreme intoxication, and I will proceed on the basis that she did indicate her consent to being beaten by you with a shoe and with your hand. I also accept that some of the injuries Natalie suffered, including the bruising to her head and the blowout fracture to her left orbit eye, which were probably her most serious injuries, may have been caused accidentally as she stumbled around in a heavily intoxicated state and collided with objects or caught herself in the face with her watch. I do not hold you responsible for those. <laughs> I swear to you now, as God is my witness, if we were talking about a man of previous good character from a council estate without a job, I wouldn't be telling this story, guys. And judge as you will, as you do. But I can tell you from my experience, I would not be telling this story. Money, success, baffles me how it has an impact on people's perspectives. Baffles me, see it all the time. I see people out there getting preferential treatment because they have a standing. Following the sentence, Natalie's father, because Natalie belonged to a loving family. She had great meaning. She has great meaning. Her father, Alan Andrews, said this. It is disgraceful, basically, to say you could be out in 22 months for doing what he did to my daughter. We can't believe it. The way he left her. The bottom of the stairs, no dignity, no well-being. It was disgraceful. The way he disregarded her, never phoned any emergency services, basically left her to die. We have to come to terms with what happened to her through the court system. They must feel absolutely broken by this. And let's just put it out there that Broadhurst had, you know, an ace barrister defending him. Because at the end of the day, you pay for what you get, kids. You pay for what you get. 
being a multi-millionaire. It helps you in cases. I will cover a case where a man basically said he was also a multi-millionaire, that he just fell into a woman when she said that she had been raped by him. And it was accepted. Because it happens, doesn't it? Men just fall into you. Just bizarre. He was also a very wealthy person, shall we say. But even if he did have this absolute s hot ability to be defended, you would think he'd be, I don't know, thanking his lucky stars. 22 months, it's nothing. Not when you consider what he'd have got for murder. Not when you consider that a woman didn't get to live another day. She never gets to kiss her little girl. She never gets to be safe in the arms of her sister, her twin, her mother, her father, none of that. Her life ended at the bottom of those stairs. So to thank your lucky stars that you've got such a minimal sentence, I would expect an acknowledgement of gratitude. But no, Broadhurst appeals this sentence. He wanted to get it reduced further. Now, in 2019, the Court of Appeal saw this and said, no, I'm going to uphold the original sentence. I'm going to tell you this. The Court of Appeal has a right to up a sentence. They could have looked at that and they could have upped it. They could have said, mate, you're going back inside for double that time. But they didn't. And they just upheld it. That means they said it was proportionate. He walked free from prison in October 2020, served 22 months. So whilst Broadhurst returned to his luxury millionaire lifestyle, Natalie's family were left for the rest of their lives to serve a sentence. And that's exactly what they will face. A life sentence of loss. Of knowing how they're much loved, adored, fun-loving, beautiful member died at the bottom of stairs, inebriated, unconscious, bleeding out. Her sister, she was so angry because during this process, you have to remember a trial essentially is public domain. So not only have we got he being painted as a man who was just having consensual sex. Natalie's portrayed differently. They make her out to be a femme fatale, shall we say. A sex vixen. An S&M queen. Gemma said this at the trial. They made her out to be some sort of sadomasochistic sex addict. She wasn't into that kind of thing at all. It made me feel physically sick because I knew the truth. That wasn't the person that she was made out to be. She didn't fantasize about being killed that night. It must be terrible for Natalie's family. It must be awful for her to be left with the legacy of that trial. To have somebody that they love portrayed as someone who is into rough sex, even though we only have the perpetrator's word on this. Like I said, no judgment on people who like that element. It's fine. But that's not what her family believed. She felt, according to their experience and their pictures and their discussions of what she talked to them about regarding her sex life. In court, basically, the word of the perpetrator was accepted by the judge. He accepted that Natalie had basically asked for the horrific injuries to be inflicted on her, even though he was the only person able to tell the tale of how the whole situation played out. He left her to bleed out and die. And her dying in such heinous circumstances, it warranted less than two years in prison. How do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile that? Now, in December 2018, Fiona McKenzie, she founded the We Can't Consent to This campaign. She'd learnt about Natalie's case and she saw, this is so wrong. So she campaigned to raise awareness surrounding the issues of violence during sexual intercourse and more importantly, to prevent the future use of the rough sex defence. Amen. 
a life is a life. In July 2020, the MPs voted in favour of the domestic abuse bill, and that includes a provision against the rough sex murder defence. The Domestic Abuse Act came into force in April 2021, and had that legislation been in place when Natalie died, Broadhurst, he could have got 25 years in jail. 25 years. Now, before that rough sex defence was banned, the We Can't Consent to This campaign identified, and this is going to boil your blood, it boils mine. They identified between 1972 and 2020, 60 police suspects or defendants in the UK used that defence. 45% of them received a lesser charge, a lighter sentence, an acquittal, or their case was not pursued. You heard me right, guys. Out of some of those cases, they didn't even take it to court. The CPS didn't think a crime had been committed. I cannot describe my disdain for individuals making decisions over people's lives and the meaning of those lives and the injuries that individuals have catastrophically received to just be thrown out because at the end of the day they wanted it right they wanted it i'm really glad that these days because of this horrific loss for natalie's family other women other men won't find themselves being in a position where their life is seen as something that they deserve to lose because of their consent in the moment. That's a good thing, but it's way too late for Natalie. You will draw your own conclusions about this case. I will say, and I can evidence time and time again, class and money, it don't just buy you nice things, kids. Sometimes it has an incredible power over freedom and liberty, your equivalents who don't come from the same class or considered as the same kind of person, well, they tend not to be afforded the same luxuries where sentencing is concerned. I feel for Natalie's families, I hope that you all send out your love, your care, your respect to this particular family who have got to cope with a 22 month sentence being considered appropriate for the loss of their daughter for the mother of the child that she loved very much, very dearly. Give me a like, give me a comment, get involved in the live chat. I love my live chat. And if you do want to subscribe, get the notifications on so that you never miss my content. Also, big thanks to all of you. If you want to support me, I have a Patreon channel and also a YouTube membership where you guys literally help me to create content as I do without you. As ever, guys, you know, ain't nothing. Also, I'm on tour in the UK. If you want to come in and see me, Serial Killer Next Door Tour, I'll be there. I love giving you hubs at the end. Love meeting you guys. See you soon.